Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kalman. It's great to be here today. What I thought I would do is begin with the title slide, Bioelectronic Medicine, the Next New Frontier in the Future of Healthcare. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I think there's two really important words in, in this title. Um, not bioelectronic medicine. That'll be obvious by the end. Frontier. What's a, what's a frontier? And what's healthcare? So on, on, on the basis of first principles, I would argue that the key to healthcare is actually the word health. And so how would you break that down? Well, the, what's the opposite of health? Disability, disease. Actually, the ultimate opposite of health would be death. So let's ask the question of, of how are we doing in health care as a human species? You know, Michael said we can learn by looking back. So let's look back 75,000 years to the time that early humans came out of the trees as talking monkeys. And how have we done since then? Well, arguably not too good. So from 75,000 years ago till today, about 110 billion people were born. There's only 8 billion people alive today. That means 102 billion died in that period. Most of them died by the time they were 30. So something happened, however. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot, WTF. <laughs> something happened there that changed everything. And what was that? The scientific revolution happened. The scientific revolution happened and changed the course of healthcare, changed the course of human life, of life expectancy, of health span, I think is a better word we can call it now, because it, it, it understood the major problem was infection. 70% of those deaths in that 75,000 years were people dying of, of infection. And the scientific revolution gave the seeds, gave the knowledge from the germ theory and, and, and ability to make vaccines, uh, to apply that and to hygiene and to eradicate the spread of infectious disease through drinking water and sewage, and ultimately, much later, actually, antibiotics. But what did that do? It changed everything. So on the healthcare idea, I call, I call the time before the scientific revolution, I call that Gen Zero. And, and the frontier for Gen Zero w w happened at the time of the scientific revolution. And today, we're the products of, of what I would call Gen One healthcare, which is pretty good. Um, but it leads to, obviously, the next question on the frontier word. We're at a frontier. I would argue we're at a frontier. That, that something else could happen that could, again, change this trajectory of life expectancy. It's not something that, that people think about a lot, but I, I'm going to show you. I think it's actually true and possible. So if 8 billion people are alive today, now they are, and we're not dying of infection, and the data are clear on that. Yes, yeah, some people die of infection, but not most of them. Most people die of something else. What do they die of? They die of cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes, obesity. That's two thirds of the 60 million deaths on the planet Earth every year are caused by these conditions, according to the WHO in, 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 uh, in the last couple of years. So what do these diseases have in common? If we're going to do a first principle basis, these diseases are either are either all caused by or made worse by inflammation. So now the question is pretty obvious. What if we eradicated inflammation as the principal problem as infection was eradicated by our predecessors? What would happen to the human race? What would, that's the frontier. So then what's inflammation? Well, Galen defined in 2,000 years ago as heat, swelling, pain, and uh, redness. And, but that doesn't really apply to Alzheimer's disease. I mean, if you look in the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, you don't see heat, swelling, pain, and redness. But clearly, inflammation is involved. So to start, I would point out that in this first principle problem, we do have a, a currently, we have a, a semantic problem. We're going to need a better understanding of what inflammation is in each of these conditions. But despite not completely understanding it, in our current generation of healthcare, we've made tremendous advances in treating inflammation. We have all kinds of drugs to treat inflammation. But they all pretty much work the same way. They immunosuppress. They eradicate the immune system's ability to control inflammation. Now, that's not always good, right? Because some amount of inflammation is good for you. You need some amount of inflammation to fight off infections and to heal from your injuries. So if you immunosuppress, 
with drugs like corticosteroids, DMARs, cytokine inhibitors, B cell depleting agents, immunomodulators, JAK inhibitors. These things have serious side effects. They make people, they may help some patients with their inflammatory condition, but they make a, but only about half the time, and they make a lot of patients feel really bad, actually feel really sick. And they put some patients at risk of dying from the side effects of the treatment. So this is not how evolution works, right? Evolution doesn't work by selecting therapies for diseases that would potentially kill the patient, which is what these things can do. How does evolution work? How, how, how are body systems normally controlled? Why are most of us in this room not suffering from overwhelming inflammation? It's because we have homeostasis. Our organ systems are regulated in a fine balance, and, and, and we have controlled responses to threat, con controlled responses to injury. That, that all occurs through the, brain, through the brain and through the nervous system. This is Kelly. She was a teenager when she developed Crohn's disease, which gave her uh, severe uh, inflammatory problems in her intestines, but it also spread to her joints, putting her in and out of a wheelchair and becoming dependent on a cane by the time she was 19. These are the drugs that are immunos the immunosuppressive anti-inflammatory drugs that she took over many years, which failed to, to help her. My colleagues and I wondered, well, these drugs did not come by natural selection. They did not come out of a natural process. What would the body's natural processes be for controlling inflammation? It turns out that the body's natural processes for controlling all of your organs it resides in your nervous system. Reflexes to your heart control how fast your heart beats. Reflexes to your lungs control how much you breathe. Reflexes to your kidneys control how much uh, kidney function you have. But at the end of the day, until quite recently, it wasn't appreciated that reflexes traveling in nerves such as the vagus nerve through your neck, that reflexes in those nerves can also control inflammation. And th that discovery, which my colleagues and I made some 28 years ago, um, works like this. What we realized is that when inflammation occurs, this is a map of a, re of a reflex. When the doctor thumps your knee, your leg goes up, you said, who did that? It's, it's because the si signals traveled up the sensory nerve to the spinal column or the brain and then back to your muscle. In the inflammatory reflex, we reasoned inflammation would, would, would be produced by molecules like TNF and IL-1, which are sensed by nerves. And it's part of the reason you feel sick when you do get sick. But re what we realized is that signals returning back to the site of the inflammation would, if it turned off the inflammation, that would be a great closed loop system to, to control inflammation. And we called that the inflammatory reflex. And, and we realized if this is true, we should be able to put electrodes onto those nerves and stop the inflammation. And, 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 that's, and, that's, how, and that's what happens. So I'll save, you, um, I'll save you the science lecture, but I, I will give you 26 years of work by hundreds of people in 26 seconds about how this works. So electrical signals travel down the vagus nerve to the splenic nerve. Inside the spleen, the electrical signals are converted to chemical signals. Here, norepinephrine is being released by the nerve endings. It interacts with a T cell called the T lymphocyte that we discovered actually produces the second signal, acetylcholine in green. And the acetylcholine interacts with the white blood cells in the spleen that are making the cytokines and causing the inflammation, and it turns them off. And so on the back of a napkin, we sketched the idea from this knowledge many years ago. We should be able to put computer chips onto these nerves in people with serious inflammation and turn it off so they don't have to take that long list of dangerous drugs that don't work. In fact, we sketched on a napkin the, the device that Murthy just held up, uh, the little chip that would go on the left vagus nerve in patients, drive these signals into the organs to turn off the inflammatory response. And so in 2007, we spun Setpoint as a startup company out of Northwell, and uh, they've done a series of clinical trials, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that it works. Uh, this is the only science slide I will show you, but you're looking at TNF levels. TNF is a cytokine. It's one of the proximal cytokines in cytokine storm. And what you're showing in, in, seeing in the first column is TNF being made in a patient before patients, before the vagus nerve stimulator was implanted. This was done at Northwell by Ash Mehta, the neurosurgeon, in collaboration with my colleague Sangeeta Shivan, and as well as the set point investigators led by Ralph Zitnick. In the second column, you're seeing the, the vagus nerve stimulator is implanted, but it's not turned on yet. 
And then four hours later, what happens to TNF after the electricity is flowing through the vagus nerve? It, as you can see, it's blocked. So we had direct evidence that all that science works in people. And, 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 and this led to a, a clinical trial. And the first patient uh, standing next to me looking a lot younger then um, is Pero. And uh, we're, we're standing in Mostar, Bosnia, in the west of Bosnia, in the Dineric Alps. And he had been, he told me he had been homebound for eight years, crippled by rheumatoid arthritis, treated with steroids and methotrexate. They, they didn't have biologics then in Bosnia. And, uh, and, he, and he told me that within two weeks of having the chip implanted in his neck, that he was able to um, start playing ping pong again. Ping pong, ping pong is a hugely popular sport in Bosnia, which is something I didn't know until uh, November of 2011. Um, and then he felt so good playing ping pong, he, he decided to start playing tennis again. The guy had been completely deconditioned, lying on his couch for eight years, so he promptly injured his knee. His, his rheumatologist then told him, take it easy, because your swollen knee is hurting your clinical score. It's messing up the trial. So they said, go back to the couch until the trial is over. So I spoke to, uh, I spoke to Pero through, he doesn't speak English, through his physician three months ago in the course of writing my book about this whole thing. And he is now, um, 13 years later, in complete remission, takes no medications, has no signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis, is playing tennis and ping pong with his children and driving a truck every day. So it's not a placebo effect. Placebo effects don't last 13 years. So one other patient uh, contacted me uh, a few years after that named Kelly Owens. And the subject line said, thank you for saving my life. And uh, her email was wedged between an email from a lobbyist in Washington complaining about the cost of research. And it was right above an email from my controller, Diane Quinn, complaining about the cost of my research. And, and, uh, <laughs> and so I read Kelly's email first. And, uh, and it, it basically said that she had heard me on Huffington Post live and reached out to her friends and family to talk her way into a clinical trial done by Setpoint in Amsterdam, where um, she took uh, her Crohn's disease and rheumatoid arthritis uh, for therapy. And um, what happened is that, um, as you'll see, is it worked. And what happened is her story, like Peros and like many, many, many other patients who have now been treated and I've met, um, suggests that we're moving into an era of the frontier is actually moving from, immuno from, a, from, from a immunosuppression to an era of treating inflammation by immunoregulation. Because immunoregulation is how the nervous system evolved over millions of years to control the immune system. And immunoregulation, if we can do it through these therapies, is likely to lead to remission and, and dare I say, cures for some of these patients. This is Kelly today. Uh, she takes no medications. She has no signs or symptoms. And uh, we know she looks like this because for several years she actually worked with us at the Feinstein Institutes at Northwell, and she was uh, organizing patient adv advocacy for us and collected thousands of patients who wanted to come in and participate in clinical trials. She gave me her cane. Uh, she no longer needs it. And if I'm having a bad day, I just turn around and look at that cane because these stories are what it's all about. This is why we all do what we do. And at this frontier, we have the opportunity now of thinking about implanting chips the size of a multivitamin to be charged. This is, this is Setpoint's device, charged by a collar. Rather than put the iPhone down on, on, onto a pad on your desk, you could put a collar around the iPhone. That's how this works. And the physician will be interacting with the, the patient on a regular basis, as they do today, to check for signs, symptoms, progress, worsening, and then altering the prescription, not by uh, writing it out on a pad or typing it, into the, typing it into the electronic medical record, but by changing the settings of the device through an iPad. I guess it's proper, I should say, through a tablet. Um, so this is a frontier. And this slide also has a lot of other challenges built into it. Rheumatologists, for instance, don't interact with neurosurgeons. I'm a recovering neurosurgeon. They don't even like us. They don't want to see a neurosurgeon in their office or in their Rolodex. So that's, it. that's a challenge because neurosurgeons or potentially ENT surgeons are going to be implanting these things. Think about referral networks. Think about the rheumatologist from the point of view of what they learned in medical school. They learned how to write a prescription pad. Now, what's this thing with the iPad? What's this thing? I'm, I'm prescribing electrons? Where's the, where does my DEA number go? Think about the payers. How's that going to work? 
what it's it's an exciting time it is a frontier it's the beginning um, we talked a lot about AI we we're talking now about bioelectronic medicine there are other domains where we are just beginning and the beginning isn't just the science to the technology to the proof of clinical concept the beginning is the whole thing it's all that stuff to, to make it implemented and, ad and adopted into practice and if we do that what's going to happen I think we're going to add 20 or 30 years to healthy human lifespan. I think Gen 2 healthcare, if we can treat infection and control it, is going to change everything like the eradication of infectious, infection did for the human race. Now, before you raise your hand and say, I don't want to live to be 130, because I guarantee at least half of you are thinking that, what if it was 1920 and the lifespan was in the 50s, maybe, late 40s, early 50s? And someone said you were going to live to be 80. Everybody would have said back then, I don't want to live to be 80. But I'm telling you now, if we do this, and if you don't have inflamed joints, and you don't have heart disease, and you don't have Alzheimer's, and you feel pretty good, and you're 125 years old, and you drive your great-great-grandkids to school, you come home and you teach your grandchild to play piano, then you go out and play tennis and write your fourth book, it might not be that bad. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>